Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm David Jameson, and I'm serving as the moderator of the panel. Uh, that gives me the uh, chance to ask the first question, and I'll get the chance to ask the last question. So. And, and you also have the right to tell me when I've talked too long. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell us when you want to go home. So. <laughs> 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 uh, <clears throat> My first question, uh, it, Aiken seems to be very hesitant to embrace public and private partnerships. Uh, folks don't understand why the public sector should be involved in any kind of a redevelopment package. Could you speak to the value of public-private partnerships? Sure, it, it's, um, it's, it's the only way, only way it will happen. And it's a, a very appropriate public role because what your, your, your goal is a public enhancement. The goal is a, a finer downtown, a place where kids or grandparents or whatever would want to be. And it's, it's really no different than, than putting in roads or sewer or water. It's infrastructure. And so to, to leverage or catalyze redevelopment of a city, uh, then if public investment is important to, to get that going, that, that's what you ought to do. And, and it's not going to happen without it. And eventually, when it takes off, then less public is needed. And then eventually, the free market system will completely take over. But if, but if you don't, you have to prime the pump. You have to make investments. And, uh, and public-private partnership is, is the only way it will happen. It happens here, I mean, in Aiken or any place in America. That's, that's what you know what you got to do. And it's perfectly legitimate, and it's essential. Mayor, we just want to thank you. We're honored that you are with us this evening, and I'm thank you, you for, uh, for, for coming to be with us. Uh, I've served for 29 years on council and naturally have seen uh, many changes, and I'm sure with 40 years you, you saw an abundance of change. <clears throat> One of the things that I hear uh, from individuals that have been here for a while is that they think Aiken is okay. They don't want to see that much growth to occur. Uh, how did you convince uh, individuals that we can have a healthy community? Charleston, for example, you can enjoy your historic charm and still grow uh, and still avoid a lot of scars. Oftentimes, as you've mentioned in, in your chamber, uh, there are people that will come and uh, very concerned about too much growth. And then even in your city, as you grow, you're growing leaps and bounds. Has Charleston, do you hear that, that Charleston has grown uh, too large? Well, um, you don't stay still. You either go up or you go down. You just, you just, you just can't stay still. And if you stay still, you'll start to slip. And uh, the same with cities. And so uh, growth is important. It should be wise growth and, and thoughtful growth and in the right kinds of things. You, you, you need to look the gift horse in the mouth. You know, we had, I had good friends come to me and say, Joe, we got a piece of property here on Market Street and we got this fellow wants to put a, a, a um, hard rock cafe. And I said, well, that, that, that doesn't fit Charleston. You know, we don't need a hard rock cafe. That's, that's just not what, so it's not that, that you're for limitless growth or anything goes, but, but it gives you energy. And you know, the infrastructure of a center city is, is an investment that can support lots of uses and lots of people. And um, you, you need, you, you either grow or you wither. You can't, um, it's one or the other. And, uh, and go, you got great, you got, as I said, the great heritage of city leadership, of a mayor and councils and city management and wise communities. So you're not going to go, you know, off on, you know, some uncontrollable, um, you know, whatever. Uh, it will be wise and thoughtful, but, but you need the energy. You gotta keep going. And, and you wanna bring young people here uh, for a host of reasons, so they'll love living here and they'll have children and grandchildren and bring new ideas and businesses 
uh, you know, and, and so much more. And then they, um, and then, you know, young people have new ideas or new ways of, of doing things and bring spirit. So you, you got to grow. Mr. Mayor, uh, leaders, whether they're business community or elected officials, all want to be liked. Um, it, it's hard, though, to be popular if you take on unpopular positions or if you're in a leader, leadership position in times of crisis and you get second-guessed. You were a mayor of a community that went through a, national, a natural disaster with Hurricane Hugo, a major financial setback with a naval base closure, a human tragedy with the Emanuel Church slings, in addition, you were an outspoken critic of the state flying the Confederate flag over the state house way before most any politician would touch that issue. You were an early supporter of Martin Luther King's holiday before the Times sort of caught up with that issue. And you, as been mentioned, you went through periodic battles with local groups when you were pushing your vision. Yet the New York Times a year ago said, or asked the question, is Joe Riley the most loved politician in America? Our elected officials are getting ready to make a lot of tough decisions for this community. What are the lessons to be drawn for those in leadership positions who are reluctant to tackle controversial and unpopular issues? Well, the, 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 the hardest work is to be confident that you're right. So that's, that's um, you know, questioning yourself, uh, Examining your your conscience, if you will, and uh, and uh, playing the devil's advocate with yourself, and, and uh, is this is this the right course of action? Sometimes you do that just within yourself or with with people you trust. And so that's that's the hard hard part is to be confident that you're right. Then, then if you are then you commit to do it, but never do it in a haughty way. It's respectful and, and always trying to explain it in a manner that, that people would be able to receive. You know, I, I always pick, picture, picture uh, the other end of the television camera was a couple sitting at home at their coffee table, or breakfast room table, or, or reading the paper. And so am I articulating this in a manner that they would say, well, you know, you know Joe, Joe might be right about that. You know, so you, you don't, take, don't treat everybody with great respect. And, and if they disagree with you, you, you accept that and listen. So if they, maybe they're saying something that you hadn't considered, but um, you just hang in there. If you have reason to believe with all that soul searching that you're right, then just don't quit and keep selling. Never stop selling. Uh, Mr. Mayor, a, a friend of mine, this spring gave me the book about you. And this was a great primer for me, for me to help remember. I was early in my career, you were early in your career. And at, at a distance, I knew things that were going on in Charleston, but not to the detail that this book uh, explores those issues. And um, I'm taken by the fact that you seem to have a battle on your hands from the day that you were elected mayor. From the very day, I believe there was a, a a battle with the janitorial staff at City Hall because you moved the furniture in your office and they moved it back the next morning. <laughs> yeah. They thought somebody had broken in and done some damage. Um, but uh, at every step you took to improve Charleston over the last 40 years, you've been met with varying levels of adversity. What kept you going? Why, were there times that you were going to throw up your hands or did you just know that you were going to make it to the finish line? Yeah, I know. I never thought of throwing up my hands. I never thought of quitting. Uh, I just, as I said, I would keep saying, are you sure you're right? And, um, and, uh, and just don't quit. And, I, um, and my good friends, Pat and Susie Rice, who, from Augusta North, Augusta here, they know my wife, Charlotte, and... Um, so I have, I have a wonderful wife, and um, so I would um, 
have my battles during the day, you know, or sometimes in the evening, council meetings. <laughs> but, um, but I would come home uh, to a, a wonderful home, and uh, we had children, and um, so we had a good family life there, and, um, and I would get my rest and repose and uh, uh, have our meals together and say the grace and eventually say our prayers. And then Chris knows I love to read. I'd get a book um, before I go to bed and read the book and get rested, get up the next morning when I was young, run three miles and go back at it. You know, that's what you do. <laughs> Just don't quit. Mayor, for a long time, um, this goes back more than three decades, you earned, you earned this reputation pretty early of being fair, of being decent, of being honest. I preface my comments there because you've looked at your city over the years and looked at diversity, looked at arts and culture and wanting to expand diversity with all of that, including the African American Museum. Share with us how that got started, if you don't mind, and some uh, lessons learned from that and some obstacles that you faced with trying to get that underway. Yeah. Well, and let me say, the, uh, the uh, African American Museum isn't a done deal yet. I'm still working hard to raise, <laughs> raise the money. I work on that every day. Um, but this is what happened. I, I'm, I grew up in Charleston. I'm 73 years old. and. Um, so, and, um, and so I, I grew up, you know, I went my, uh, all of my experiences as a child were segregated experiences. You know, no schools were integrated. Um, and uh, the first African American I sat down and had a meal with was after I was elected to the General Assembly. So I'm from way back, um, you might say. And, um, but two things happened to me, I, there have been a lot of things. But um, first, uh, on August 20th, 1963, I was sitting in front of the TV set. My older sister was giving birth to a baby at the hospital, and so we were all on pins and needles. And so I gave all my attention to the TV set and heard Dr. King speak. And, um, and I had grown up you know, with all the apologist, apologies and rationalization for why I should be separate, this, that, and the other. And, um, and, um, and Dr. King, you know, reached me. And um, Ralph McGill, who was the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, a very progressive editor of paper in the South back then, said that Dr. King did as much for white Southerners as he did for black Southerners because he exposed white Southerners of goodwill to their conscience. So I had that awakening. And then when I got in the legislature, I found myself gravitating towards those kinds of causes. But that was just general. And then in 1998, uh, a fellow who had a Charleston pedigree, Edward Ball, uh, wrote a book, Slaves in the Family, which won the National Book Award um, eventually, I mean later that year. But I read it because I knew the fellow not well. And, um, and that, I was then confronted with history I didn't know. And it's a history that America doesn't know. And that's why I work on this so passionately, and that is the history of, of Africans being captured, enslaved, enchained, and brought here, and their life here. We know, we know a fair amount of civil rights history. But we, as Americans, see, it's what I realized, well, this is American history. We're all Americans. You know, we're all Americans. And so we know about the Mayflower and the Pilgrims and all of that. Um, but we don't know about the civilizations that existed in Africa, which were old, and people captured from those and brought here, and then what their life was like. And, um, and 40, it's 48% of all enslaved Africans that came to North America came to Charleston. So I realized after reading that book that Charleston had a history I didn't know and that it was, we had a duty to all those who were brought here. But we had a duty to ourselves to help present this history. 
And, and it isn't a history that leaves you depressed because it's an ultimate story of human spirit and determination and courage and perseverance and, 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 and a story of a government founded on principles that all men are created equal, endowed with unalienable rights, and, and a country that when confronted with the realities that those that wasn't in practice work to change it. So, so it's, a, it's a very important American story, but in Charleston, if the, the new museum opened in DC, and I'm a charter member of that museum and worked with the director and was there for the groundbreak and there for the opening a couple of Saturdays ago, there last week, um, taking a group of supporters of that museum. And um, he said years ago when we were you know, working on our idea and he was working on his, he said, you know, Joe, there are few sacred sites of African-American history in this country. And then he cried himself. He said, in this hemisphere. And the site where you are building your museum, which was Gadsden's Wall, is one of the most sacred sites in this hemisphere because it's, it was a primary place of arrival. So we know about Ellis Island, and we can so that whether our ancestors came to Ellis Island or not, and mine didn't, it's, it's about, you know, it's the metaphor of, the, of, of people coming here, in this instance voluntarily, but it's a place. You know, there's a place kind of put a movement with the place. And so with uh, Gadsden's Wharf, then we have a place of arrival, very different in terms of that arrival, but nonetheless a, a, a part of America. And um, so that's, that's why I work on it every day. The Citadel is very supportive of my working on it. The college is very supportive of my working on it. My wife is very supportive of my working on it. I work on it every day. I worked on it today. Um, I'll work on it tomorrow. Uh, and I'll work on it till we get all the money raised. And, but I'll tell you this, Bobby Hitt is a state director of the commerce. Okay. He said, Joe, you get that building built. And when I'm recruiting business and industry to South Carolina, and they ask me to tell them about South Carolina, that will be first on my list. Because that will speak of, of the true South Carolina, which is what we are. And so that's the long answer to your question. But it's, my, it's the most important work of my life. And uh, we'll be able to build something to honor people uh, forgotten and not honored, and, and a place that will inspire all of us. Uh, and make us realize the wonderful country that we've become. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, when governments design and build projects, their leaders are under excruciating pressure to build things that are functional or utilitarian. In other words, just build the basics. I read something on the internet this afternoon, so I'm sure it's true. I, I hope you can, <laughs> hopefully you will confirm this. I read that when Charleston, when you were planning the waterfront park, you insisted on what you called beautiful materials. You said, we made it beautiful. And according to the story, you received the bids, and they were over budget. And the contractor said to you, don't worry, Joe, I can get it down. We'll just take the gold plate out of it. And you supposedly said, we're not taking any gold plate out. I'll find the money. If it's in this city, it's got to be done right. If that's true, and I, I, knowing you, I would think it is, mm -hmm. talk about the importance as we look forward with the city and the building program of establishing a standard of excellence in everything well, we do in Aiken. The, uh, and, and it was, and he used the term gold plate, uh, and I would use the term excellence. Um, we, we all aspire for excellence. Um, in, in our work we do, whatever profession we're in, if it's a, a lawyer or a surgeon or whatever. And um, so cities, since cities are the ultimate public uh, vessel, then it should read excellence. And um, so if it builds something, it should be beautiful. Because human beings see it. And uh, you build a park, um, make it as fine as you possibly can, and, um, 
and, and the thing is, you know, sometimes we think that, that, um, that those things are kind of elitist things, you know, um, but they're not. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, I, uh, there's this liquor store that I go to very infrequently, uh, hardly ever. <laughs> But, um, but it was a liquor store that I, uh, that was operated by guys I grew up with. And um, so they, um, they all wore pistols. And I mean, the city is very safe, but they got permit to have pistols on. So it was kind of, you know, they had a holster, you know, and all right there. And um, so I went in there one day for my modest purchase for a staff party. And um, <laughs> so, so these guys, they saw me coming and they started converging behind the counter. Now we mayors know that that, you see sometimes that, that's just body language that they're upset about something, you know. So you brace for that, you know, momentary unpleasantness. So I, they came together and, um, and we had this old intersection downtown that was just all asphalt, and, and um, so some, we were putting a water line down there, and a friend of mine said, Joe, while you're all digging that up, why don't you plant something in there? We didn't need all asphalt. So I gave the idea to my park people, and they came up with the plan. And so we planted palm trees and live oak and little grasses and all like that. And so at the liquor store, one of these guys leaning on his pistol said, Joe, you know what y'all did down there at Broad and Raleigh? I said, yeah. He said, that's the prettiest thing I ever saw. <laughs> and another fellow said, Lean on his pistol, said, You know where I live, don't you? And I said, Yeah, I did. But he means lean on his pistol. I said, Sure, I know where he lives. <laughs> and, um, and he said, I drive two miles out of my way going home tonight, every night just to ride by that. And then they wanted to get into new flower beds we'd done and, and then how the, how the new building blended with the old. So these fellas whose business was working in a liquor store wanted to talk to their mayor about beauty. So we, we, you know, it's not, it's, it's, that's, you give that to every single person. So with that park, or if it's a fire station, or it's a public building, or anything, you, if you make it handsome and, and beautiful, then that's a gift to every citizen, the richest person in town, the poorest person in town, the most highly educated person in town, the least educated person in town, and they all understand it. And we often just think they don't, but they do. And they want it, and they need it, and it, and it you know, it lifts them. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask the final question now. Sure. Um, let's tie a bow around this session. And if you would, please, speak directly to Mayor Osmond, who's sitting right there in front of you, <laughs> and give him three pieces of advice about moving Aiken forward. Well, the mayor doesn't need any advice from me. <laughs> and, um, well, um, forward is the important word. Forward, advance forward. Um, recognize the um, huge asset that exists here the asset and the character of the place, and its heritage and history, its form, its location, uh, and build on that. And then, with your citizens all, aspire for greatness. So, you know, I used to say, we should also be a great city. And that has nothing to do about size at all. It's, it's just about excellence. Just, just work for that excellence and, um, and, and with, with your dear townsfolk here tonight, have that commitment to, to make your city center a lively, beautiful, thriving, robust place that gives energy to senior citizens and their grandchildren. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> it's going to come back. Can we have a, a hand for our panel, please, tonight? What a great job. We appreciate each of you. Those were some thoughtful questions and thought-provoking. And for Mayor Riley for being with us tonight. Thank you.
Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As we close tonight, just let me say this. We have a history that we're proud of, and we have a story in Aiken that we're proud of. But can we commit to work together to move forward and be proud of our future in Aiken tonight? Can we do that? And we're going to do like the mayor said. We're going to make room at the table so everybody has a voice in it. But I think it's so important. Thank you for sharing with us, inspiring with us. Don't you appreciate the Main Street program for, for having this tonight? We really do. We thank you. We thank the Aiken Downtown Development Association for their work involving in this. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention our own city, John McMichaels, who put so much of this together. Thank you all of you for all your work for this. This, this concludes our first meeting. This is a part of a series, though, so we hope you'll look forward to it. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. God bless everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight.